Okay. Good morning, everybody. So I'm, I'm glad to see so many uh, people come out to this new JavaScript track. We kind of put this together in, at the last minute based on uh, the new events in the WordPress world. Uh, so I'm actually, I don't, actually don't have anything to do with WordPress. I'll talk about, my, my, about myself later. But I do know my JavaScript, so that's sort of why I'm here. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about uh, advanced topics of JavaScript, exploring the function, JavaScript function. So functions are really important in JavaScript, and so we'll take a look at what that means. Okay. Uh, so, is this working? Okay. So please uh, feel free to interrupt me, raise your hand, whatever, for questions. I'm totally, 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 totally okay with interruptions for questions. This is, is for you guys to learn, so I want you to, to have you know, all your questions answered. And at the end of this talk, I'm also going to be at the Happiness Bar hanging out, at least for the next half hour after my talk. So, so, uh, and then I'll just be here in the, for the rest of the day. So please uh, feel free to ask me questions. It's fine. Uh, all right, so today we're going to be talking about the wild world of functions. And so let's, let's give a little context about what we're doing here before we start. So JavaScript is a bit nutty. It's a bit crazy. And uh, unfortunately, it will remain so forever. OK, for, not forever, but maybe for the foreseeable future. Why is that? Because uh, we, we, like, we, it has a lot of quirks. It was made in actually like two weeks. And uh, we don't want to break the web. We want uh, pages from 15 years ago, their JavaScript to keep working just like it did 15 years ago today. So we have a problem. All those crazy things that it does, we're, they're here to stay. We're not getting rid of them. So instead, what we're going to do is to uh, maintain backwards compatibility, we're going to A, learn about the things that are bad and stay away from those, and B, uh, the, 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 sp the standard is going to be up updating itself constantly, not with changing the old things, but with introducing new things that fix the things that the old things do bad. Okay? So, <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to talk about that, but, but, but just so you know, we're not breaking the web. That's why JavaScript is so wack weird and wacky, because we just can't, we just can't fix those things. Uh, I have to point this over here, like this. No? No? Oops, wrong button. It's my, it's my bad. Uh, so it's especially crazy and eccentric with functions. Eccentric is a euphemism. Some of you may know that for, for, for insane. Anyway, so, uh, so and functions are the, one of the most important things that, that JavaScript has. A lot of, in JavaScript, you, you do with functions. It's really, really important. So it's, it's really weird uh, that it does so much things with the most important, their most important object, but we have to learn about them because, well, well, they're important. So that's what we're going to try to do. So we're going to try to address some of those weird things that JavaScript does, uh, and uh, things especially that throw off new developers when they're learning this stuff. Okay? So we're here to help with those things. So number one, functions are values. Okay? That's the first uh, topic. Uh, in JavaScript, functions are values. What does that mean? It's odd for a, for a language to have this property. Uh, so you might have heard this, this term, uh, functions are first class citizens in JavaScript. Uh, how many people have heard that? Okay, how many people know what that means? Okay, like a fourth of you. What that means is when you create a function in JavaScript, it is an object. It is a value, just like when you create a string, that is a value. Our numbers are values, arrays are values, and, and, and all those things are values and objects, just like a function is. That means you can assign it to a variable. So when you create a function like this, you have a variable automatically created for you. So let's say I have this console log function here. And uh, so I can call it, see, in, in that, in that uh, first line there, it's saying greeting, open parentheses, close parentheses. I'm calling the function. But I can also print out greeting itself. By defining a function, uh, Greeting itself is a variable that's created that has the contents of this object that is a function. That's what that means. Okay? When you define a function in other languages, they're not objects. They're not values. You can't assign them to a variable. You can't pass them around. Uh, so a similar thing you can do in PHP, I'm, I'm assuming that some of you are familiar, maybe more familiar with PHP than, than with JavaScript. You can do a similar thing by assigning a function to a variable like this. And so by assigning this function to a variable, uh, um, I, you can call it with its variable name, and then, but the variable itself, if you var dump it, it's, it's an object. Okay? It's an instance of a class or something. Uh, so you can also do a similar thing in JavaScript where you're assigning you know, the, the fun an anonymous function, is what we call that, 
to a variable, and that also works just the same as the previous example does. Uh, now, you'll see me in my examples, I'm mostly going to use this style, which is using the function keyword and then the name rather than assigning the variable. So, but ultimately, it's the same end result most of the time. <laughs> there are exceptions, but we're not, not, we're not really going to talk about this. So mostly, I'll be doing something like this. Okay. All right. So uh, the first thing I want to show you is that the function is an object, and most objects in, in, uh, in JavaScript are immutable. You can set properties to them. So here what I'm doing is, is, aside from just hello world like I did before, I'm also keeping track of this amount property of this greeting object. So I'm starting it at zero over here, starting it at zero. Then every time I call it, I'm calling it twice, I'm, I'm incrementing it by one. And so at the end, I'm going to console log greeting amount. That's going to give me a result of two. So it keeps track of that property just like it would in a regular object. Okay? And because a function is an object, you can, you can do that. And because it's a mutable object, you can do that. If you assign a, 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 a number to a variable like this uh, and try to set a, a property on that number, you can't do it because numbers are immutable. Uh, you can even assign a function as one of its properties because it's an object. And we'll circle back to doing this kind of thing later. So, uh, and so this is gonna, kind of making a makeshift method. I'm, calling, I'm, calling, I'm treating this greeting thing like, a, like an object, like a class, and then I'm making a new method on it called the Spanish version of, of Hello World, which is Hola Mundo. And uh, so here I am calling it. So greeting itself is a function. I'm calling it. Greeting that Spanish is also a function or a method, and I'm calling it. And that, that, wor that works. That's fine. Doesn't, doesn't complain about that. With me so far? Great. So practical uh, application of functions being values, passing functions as arguments to other functions. So when you pass a function to, as an argument to another function, the passed function is called a, a callback, a callback. And basically when you're using callback, you're saying, run this function that I'm providing for you when blank, when something happens. Now that something could be when the user clicks a button, that something could be when the page loads, that something can be in three seconds. The condition under which the function will be called will change, but, but the concept is the same. I'm passing some instructions to you to do when, when uh, that thing is, is ready. So what does that look like? Uh, well, like I said, the com one of the common cases for callbacks is, is uh, click handlers in jQuery. Uh, how many people here are familiar with jQuery? Uh, so how many people here, their JavaScript code is uh, centered around the use of jQuery? OK, so most of you, right. So here what I'm saying is, OK, well, select my button, and then run this instruction when the user clicks that button. And, and that's it. That, so that, that anonymous function that I'm defining there that anonymous function is the callback, okay? So function values you pass into other functions are known as, oh, I just said that. I went back, sorry. Let's go forward. <laughs> okay, and you can also pass in a function by using its variable name instead of having an anonymous function. Okay, and again, in this case, I'm naming the function, I'm saying function do stuff, this is my callback function, and then I'm passing it in as an argument, just like you would pass in a regular variable as an argument. Uh, yes? The question is, if there's an advantage to doing it this way as anonymous functions, readability is the only one that, the most, the biggest one. There may be other advantages too, but then that's the main one. Um, actually, I'll, I'll show you uh, uh, an example with a set timeout function later, especially with a set timeout. It's really, it's really way better to do it this way than the other way. Although I'll be using both in, in, in the examples. Good question. What's that? Oh, re yeah, re when you, you can reuse it as well. If you name the function, you can use it in multiple places. Uh, but not in this example, I'm only using one, so it doesn't matter. Uh, okay. Oh, so, and just as a reminder, the callback is not click. Click is not the callback. Do stuff is the callback. The callback is the function that you pass. Okay. Uh, all right. So part three, function scopes and closures. Uh, this is another really important thing that's really weird. This especially is really weird that JavaScript does. And uh, of obviously, it's centered around functions. So let's, let's talk about this. So local variables in JavaScript have a specific scope, okay? 
so local variables are those that are created with var. Notice in my examples I've been creating, every time I do a var, uh, looking for one here. Okay, here. Var greeting equals function whatever. That makes greeting a local variable. Okay. Okay. So, a variable scope determines what parts of the code it can be used in. So the scope uh, is about the visibility of the variable. Where, where can it be seen and where can it be used? So, if else statements and other non-function blocks do not constitute a new scope. So for example, in my first line here I'm saying var pizza equals pepperoni. By the way, all my examples are pizza related. I apologize if you're hungry. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so. Uh, here, my first line is saying, okay, I'm setting pizza equal to pepperoni, it's a string, fine. Then I'm saying, if true, that makes the if always happen, right? Uh, and I'm saying, okay, var pizza equals mushroom. Even though I said var pizza equals again, it's actually referring to the same pizza variable, okay? So inside that if statement and outside the if statement, we're both talking about the same scope. It's the same set of variables here. So pizza there and pizza inside, they're both the same pizza. So when I change pizza in the if, it gets changed outside the if as well. Okay. So I get mushroom here, mushroom. Uh, but JavaScript has function scope, which means that you create a new set of variables inside a function. So in this example, I'm starting out the same way, pizza equals pepperoni, uh, and I'm making a new function called print pizza. And in print pizza, I'm making another instance variable called pizza as well, and I'm sending it to mushroom. Inside the function, that pizza is mushroom. Outside the function, pizza is still pepperoni. So print pizza prints out mushroom because in here, pizza is mushroom. But outside, console log pizza still remembers, oh yeah, I have this variable called pepperoni, so this pizza and that pizza are two in, in, like, in, separate, in separate bubbles. They're in like parallel dimensions, okay? They don't, know, they don't know about each other. They have the same name, but uh, they're different. They're different variables. Okay. So when you open up a function, you have a new set of variables. But there's some caveats. <laughs> like everything in JavaScript, there's, there's some issues here. So the key thing to remember about JavaScript function scope is Disney Pixar. And I find mnemonics are a really good way to, to, uh, for, to learn tricky, con tricky concepts. So I don't know if you, how many have heard the mnemonic uh, righty tighty? Righty tighty. When you're twisting like a, a screw, you twist it uh, to the right and it tightens to the left. It. Okay, so that we're going to learn uh, one for JavaScript. Here we go. Ready? Variables can be seen from the inside out. <laughs> Disney Pixar. <laughs> Disney Pixar. Inside out. You can see variables from the inside out, which is to say that variables declared outside can be seen from the inside, but you cannot see variables declared in the inside from out. You can see inside out. Okay, Disney Pixar. I say Disney Pixar because it's hard to switch, it's easy to switch up inside out and outside in, so. Disney Pixar, what's that movie? Inside out, okay, okay, good. So what does that mean? That means that I can see inside out. So inside this new print pizza, I can see that the value of this pizza variable is Hawaiian. This variable, I can still see it because from the inside of print pizza, I know the stuff that's outside it too. So print pizza still results in the right value, the value you'd expect. On the other hand, if I have another function called print large pizza, and then here I'm defining a new variable called large pizza, and that's a large four cheese pizza. Uh, so inside, that works. So over here, when I'm calling large pizza, that works just fine. But outside, I try to use large pizza and I get a reference error. My JavaScript blows up because I cannot see outside in. I can see inside out. So that large pizza, that is a local variable, variable inside of large pizza and inside, inside of print large pizza only. Outside, that thing does not exist. And you will get an error like this one. Yes? So the question is, in this, in, 
it doesn't destroy. Okay, so the question is, if I go back a couple slide, a couple steps, uh, over here. Uh, so I've declared here a pizza variable inside print pizza, and does that override it? Does that destroy it? Well, it, uh, with JavaScript, it doesn't destroy it. It just for this scope, I cannot, I can no longer access the previous pizza. I only, I only have this new pizza. So what it does is that it looks, it has, a, has, a, has basically an order in which it looks up names. If you name something, if you try to use something called pizza, it's going to look in, in things in order. It's going to say, okay, first, let me look at this current function scope. It's going to look for inside print pizza. Do I have something called pizza? Okay, if it doesn't, it's going to look at the next scope above that. It's going to say, okay, do I have something here? And it's going to keep doing that because you can have functions inside of functions inside of functions inside of functions. But it's going to stop when it gets to the, what we call the global scope. And if the thing doesn't exist in the global scope, you'll get a reference error. Okay. But it does not override it. It's just that in this scope, my local variable pizza takes precedence over the one in the outside scope. And once you define it inside, you can't get the outside anymore. And there's a really weird thing that happens exactly because of that. I, I don't have the example here, but ask me later and I'll show you. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so I've the, the, now the, the key thing to remember here is, the, is the, this var part. It's because of this var, because I'm making this a local variable inside print large pizza, that's what, that's what makes it local to the, to the function. Okay? If I don't have var, I'm going to get a global, global variable. That is accessible everywhere. That is not a good thing, and we're not going to get into why, but it's not a good thing. Okay, so stick to your vars. And stick to your vars and understand scope. This is what, that's our goal here. Okay. Uh, so practical application of, of this scoping thing, uh, you can actually use that to your advantage. If you define a, a if, you, if all your application is inside a function, other scripts cannot access it, access any of your variables. They're, they're protected. They're protected from any outside tampering. This is especially important when you're installing a bunch of WordPress plugins that install a bunch of JavaScript that you don't really know, like you don't have time to go over and read every single line of JavaScript that's running on your page. And so you're adding all these other uh, scripts, and because if you have all your stuff inside a function, then all your stuff is protected. They can't accidentally change the value of a variable or rename a function or anything like that. They can't mess with your stuff. Everything's protected. Okay. Uh, so this looks weird, but you'll see this a lot. How does this work? Well, I've got, a, I've got an anonymous function here, and what are, what are these? What are these? Okay. Well. Uh, this is called an iffy. Uh, it stands for immediately invoked in function expression. And so even though I don't have a name up here, I can add these parentheses around the function definition, but also after. And that, what that does is it invokes the function immediately. It defines a function on the fly and calls it immediately, even though I don't have a name. Now, if I don't put these parentheses, these parentheses outside the function definition, around the function definition, I'm going to get an error. But, and these two parentheses are actually just to run it, because in, since functions are values, if you put the name of a function without the parentheses, it just says, oh yeah, that's a variable, and doesn't try to run it. So I need these two parentheses to run the function, to invoke the function, and then I'm going to get an error unless I put these around the function itself. So this is a way, you'll see this all the time, this is a way to, to basically put all your stuff inside a function that's protected against other, other people, other scripts. Okay? Uh, there's a link up here to, the, to an, uh, an in-depth article about iffies. Okay. It's like five years old, but anyway, it's still, it's still good. I promise it's still good. <laughs> okay, iffy. Uh, you'll see that a lot. That's why I teach. Okay, so scoping can also be used to make variables private. There's no way to make a variable attached to an object private by default, okay? So if I go all the way back to that, that example where I was doing, uh, I was counting, I, I had pizza.amount or greeting.amount, and I was counting the, the amount of times I was running greeting. Well, there's nothing preventing you from actually resetting that to zero, or somebody else resetting that to zero. So to make these variables truly private, you have to take advantage of scoping. So uh, let's see. Uh, so I don't have an example of the privates. But, uh, so, so remember that this works inside out. So for example, if I had this function do pizza stuff, and I'm setting a local variable pizza called onion and garlic for onion and garlic pizza, and then inside that do pizza stuff, I have a print pizza function, uh, and I call that pizza function, 
Uh, this still works because of inside out. Inside the print pizza function, I have access to the var pizza of do pizza stuff. That's fine. This works as of inside out. So when I call do pizza stuff, it sets this variable, it defines what print pizza is, and it calls print pizza as well. Okay. Uh, but typically, what you do is, uh, well, this works because uh, you can, any, any, this is called a closure. So when you have a function that makes use of, of, a, of, a, func of a variable that's not in its scope, that is called a closure. So in this example, my print pizza function over here is a closure because it uses pizza. It uses a variable that's not in its scope. So now this is a really contrived example because you're just calling this function that's making this function, it's calling this function. But okay, let's see how you really use this. Typically, what you do is you return the closure, which is to say that if I call my function create pizza printer and I send it a variable, I send it a value, and then I return this function called print pizza over here. So let's look at what this does. I'm saying, okay, var onion printer equals create pizza printer. Create pizza printer receives this kind of, the type of pizza, and then it, it returns, it may, they find this function print pizza that uh, says, hey, I'm just gonna print that thing out. And then you're returning this, this variable. So onion printer is now print pizza, but it has, it's bound to the value of onion and garlic. So if I call onion printer, it's always gonna print out onion and garlic. I know, I know. It's, it's complicated, it's complicated. So this is a way of basically making this function onion printer that always prints out onion and garlic and no one can tamper with that pizza value, okay? No one can tamper with it. It's still there. Like, pizza remembers that pizza is onion and garlic. It remembers that. But no one can go in and mess with it. No one can change the value of pizza. Okay? So you will see this a lot. Okay? You will see this a lot. You'll have a function that returns a function. And basically, it's just creating a function with a certain set of, of fixed values. Okay? So just to recap, create pizza printer is receiving this pizza, the string. It's creating a new function called print pizza. And it's, that just prints that string, and then it's returning the new function. So onion printer is now print pizza, but except that this variable pizza is always going to be onion and garlic. So, yes. Yes. Nothing changes. So notice that onion printer, onion printer is analogous to print pizza. What are the arguments of print pizza? So the question was, if, what happens if I pass in an argument to, print, to onion printer? Well, print pizza doesn't have any arguments. Create pizza printer has arguments, and that's only being called one time. And even if you call create pizza printer again with a new set of, of with a new string, that will not affect onion printer because every time you call create pizza printer. This is actually creating a new print pizza function for that one call, okay? So if I do this, if I say I have onion printer this and then pe and pepperoni printer with a different kind of pizza, print, onion printer remembers that I'm supposed to print onion, pepperoni printer remembers it's supposed to print pepperoni, okay? So the, what you send to onion printer does not matter because print pizza doesn't receive any arguments. Oh, well, yeah, of course you can redeclare the variable and change it. Yes, that, that works. No problem. Uh, onion if you pass into a variable into onion printer, so what happens if you pass into a variable with onion printer? Well, uh, it just ignores it. It, it just ignores it. Because, uh, so there's no, there's no like argument errors. So some languages, if you, if you, if you don't pass in this, the right amount of arguments, you'll get an, you'll get an error. JavaScript does not care about that. You can, pass in, you can pass in 57 arguments into Onion Printer and it won't complain, but it won't make use of any of them because this function is not defined to use any arguments. So it just, igno it just ignores them. Whew, complicated, okay. Uh, so practical application of this function, uh, again, making variables private, okay? So if I have a create counter here, this is a much better version of what I was trying to do before. I have a function, create counter, that it sets up a variable count and then it returns a function, an anonymous closure, that makes use of count, OK? 
Okay? So create counter is set to my counter. What does that do? It sets count to zero and returns the function that adds one to count and then returns that new count. So every time I call my counter, I'm going to get incremented by one. But nobody can touch my count variable. Even if I create 50 counters, each of those individual counters will have its own count variable. Everybody will have their own stuff. Everybody's protected. There's no way that I know of to, uh, to mess with the count except by calling the function, the my counter function. Okay? So if you have your counter, I have my counter, and somebody else has their third counter, uh, everybody has their own count. Nobody can affect each other's count, and nobody can reset or, or, or touch each other's count. Everybody has their own count, and the function is the only one who's able to access that count. So basically what I'm doing is I'm making var count private. Every time I, cre I do create counter, I'm making a function and I'm making a new count variable, and that thing is roped off. Nobody can touch that. And you can also use this to make uh, pro uh, properties and methods on an object uh, private, although I'm not showing an example of that, but that, that's something that, that has happened. That's called the module, the module pattern. You'll see that a lot, module pattern. Okay. All right, Whew. scope, wow, that was tough. Okay, so aside from function scope, there's also a thing called function context. So function context and this, let's talk about that. So functions also have a context in addition to a scope. And the context is basically an object that owns the call to the function, that owns the call to the function, okay? Let's see that in action. So every function's context in that particular call is represented by this magical keyword called this, okay? Every time you call a function, this is going to have a value. And you don't have to define that. That just happens automatically. That's, it's, it's magic. Okay? It's magic. So here I have another print pizza function. Here my pizza is fancy arugula because some pizzerias try to get fancy and they just throw arugula on the pizza. And uh, so I'm printing out the pizza and also printing out this, okay? which is, again, the magically defined keyword. So let's see what that does. Uh, so this is magical because it changes depending on how the function is invoked depending on how you call or execute the function. So it can have potentially uh, different, can potentially have different and unexpected values, and we'll see why. And boy, this is, this is the source of so many problems, uh, especially when you're starting out. Everybody, like, literally everybody gets hit by some sort of this context problem. Like, this, this, will, this will happen, okay? Don't, even if you know about it, it will happen. <laughs> So the manner of execution of the function determines the rules for the context, the rules for this. We're going to see a couple different examples. Not all of them, because one of them is really weird, but anyway. So Im imagine that. The ones we're seeing are weird. The two ones that we're seeing are weird. And there's a third one that's even weirder that we're not going to see. <laughs> anyway. OK, so if I have a regular function, regular function, just like the one I had before. Oops. Spoiler. Regular function. Just like the one that before, what's that going to do? It's going to print fancy arugula because pizza is fancy arugula, and it's also going to print an object called window. So when you define a regular function and call it just like you always do, that thing, that thing in this particular case, this is going to be window. What does that mean? When you call a function like this with just the name of the function and an argument, nobody owns that function. It's, it's that particular call of the function is, is like a, it's like a, it's like a Ronin. It's like he doesn't have a master. And so window is the global object. What is window? All global variables and functions are properties of window. It's the global object. Every JavaScript environment has a global object. I'm using here, I'm assuming that most of you, most of you are going to be running JavaScript on the browser. And in the browser, the global object is window. So everything is on window, everything. Okay? This is just a small sample of all the things that are on window. The array class, the number class, the object class, the regular expression class, the console, the where we use console log, the document where you do document on ready and all that stuff, set timeout, which you're going to see later, undefined, everything, 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 everything that ever was in JavaScript is on window. Uh, 
And so when you call a function like, normally you do, like you normally do, this is going to be window. The context is window, because it doesn't really have an owner. And so the default owner is the global object, which is window. Okay, With me so far? The other main way to call function is as a method of an object, like we already saw. Okay. So let's, let's, take a simple, let's make a simple pizza object and call a method on it. Okay. So let's, let's get this simple pizza object. It's got two properties, toppings and cheese. Okay, I don't know why you want to change the cheese, of, the cheese of a pizza, but bear with me. Okay. Toppings and cheese. So toppings here are fancy, is fancy arugula like, like it was before, like those fancy pizzerias trying to be fancy. Uh, and then cheese is mozzarella because it's mozzarella, guys. Come on. Okay. Why would you want to change that? <clears throat> so because I have this object called pizza, I can do pizza.toppings. That will get me fancy arugula. Because I have this object and it has a property cheese, I can say dot cheese and it gives me mozzarella. Okay, with me so far? So let's add a print method to that. Okay, so we're just saying pizza.print and we're, we're modifying this object in, real, in, in memory and saying, okay, let's add a function to this. Let's add a method to this. It's called print. So it's going to do this. It's going to say console log. So I'm, I'm shortening the, 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 the pizza to one line just so, because it looks better on the slides. Uh, and so let's see, there's a pizza.print equals a function, sim so what we're doing is console logging this.toppings, this.cheese, and then a bunch of strings, we're concatenating the strings, okay? So when you call a method, when you call a method, this is no longer the, uh, the window because it has an owner. Print has an owner, the owner is pizza. And so any, inside that method, and whenever you call, uh, whenever you call uh, this, this is going to be pizza. So this.toppings is really pizza.toppings. This.cheese is really pizza.cheese. And so you get this message, fancy arugula and mozzarella pizza. Okay? So this is like a self-referential thing, and PHP works just the same way, right? You have this and, and, and a stabby, stabby arrow, and then the, the name of the variable, right? Same thing, okay, same thing. So here's where it gets complicated, okay? I apologize in advance. Here, here it comes, here it comes. If you assign that method to a variable like this, var print pizza equals pizza.print, because pizza.print, because it's a function in JavaScript, it's an object, you can assign it to a different variable. If you do that, this, and you call that function like, like a normal function, because you're calling it like a normal function and not like a method, it no longer has an owner. It is, uh, it, it went rogue. It goes rogue on you and this inside this function now is window.toppings and window.cheese. And if you don't happen to, by some weird accident, have a, dot che a cheese and toppings variable that are global, you'll get undefined and undefined pizza. And I think we can all agree that nobody wants an undefined pizza, right? We want to know what's on there. We want to know what's on there. Okay. That's the only joke I have today. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> so, so, you can do this. This is crazy, but you can do this. You can say, okay, I'm going to take this method. It's an object. I'm just going to assign it and then call it. And then boom, your this is, your this is are all borked. Your this is are all screwed. Okay. So what do you do? What do you do? Oh, so you want to take a picture? I'm having, I'm looking at the slides in it. Okay. You're good. Okay. Fine. Anyway. <clears throat> uh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Cool. Right here. So one thing you can do, one thing you can do, I'm not saying this is this thing that you should do, but it's a thing you can do. Uh, is when, after you assign that pizza, instead of calling it like you normally call it, you use this method on fun that all functions have. It's called dot .call. Okay? What dot .call does, it allows you to set the context of any function explicitly. You're saying, okay, call print pizza, but make sure that this is pizza. That's what that's doing. So if you do that, uh, this and this inside the print, uh, inside of that function, they're going to work like you would expect them to. Okay. Well, we're getting to that. We're getting to that. Okay. I'm guiding you. Okay. I'm guiding you. You have to trust me. Okay. Okay. If you don't do this, what do you do? Okay. What do you do? Uh, well, before we get to what it, what you actually do, <laughs> uh, the problem with this is that you have to you have to do dot call every time you want to call the the thing, and that's not that's not practical. Okay, that's not practical. You have to do dot .call, dot .call, dot .call, and it's very, very wordy. And just as an FYI, uh, wait, no. Okay, but the advantage of this, the advantage of this, 
of doing dot call is that you can actually change the context of the function on the fly, which is pretty cool. Granted, you know, for example, if I have a, a second pizza object where the toppings is bison, bison, and the cheese is cheddar, I don't know why you want to do that. Again, I'm sorry. I don't know what this, you know, mozzarella. Okay. Uh, anyway, so uh, so so I can do the same. So this is still pizza.print, which is this function. And I can say dot call pizza, and that will do what it did before. But I can also say dot call other pizza, and it and it, it it just changes dynamically. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So as an FYI, you can also do a similar thing with dot apply. Dot apply is similar to call in this way and in this way only. Um, there is another really really cool and subtle difference between dot apply and dot call, which we're not going to get into. But if you're curious about that, ask me later. Okay. <clears throat> I just want to be thorough. Uh, okay, so again, you have to do it call by call. It's not practical, so you have to do this every time, Ugh, right? But another alternative is to use bind. Bind. So bind is another method on function. Every function has this dot bind method. And what this does is it fixes the, the context. It fixes the value of this for this function, okay? So when I'm assigning my function, if I do pizza.print.bind and then say, okay, bind this to pizza, print pizza is now going to be bound to pizza all the time. The pizza object is now married to print pizza, like you would expect it to. And so now, every time you call print pizza, you don't have to do any fancy tricks, it just works. It just works the way you want it to. It just works. Um, okay. So what this is really doing is it's creating a new function. It's creating a new function with the this fixed. So I I'm, I'm here as an example, I'm just saying like, okay, print pizza, is it equal to pizza.print? Are they the same object? No, they're not. Print pizza, because I did bind, that automatically created a new function and returned it. So they're no longer the same function. They do the same thing. The difference is that print, pizza.print, that guy has no, he has no loyalty. He can change. He can change the this anytime. Print pizza, that guy has loyalty. He's bound to this pizza object right here. He cannot, and furthermore, you cannot change the context of that function anymore. That new function that bind creates, that thing is, that thing is set. It's baked in, you cannot change it. So even if I do, on that new bound function, if I try to do dot call and try to change the this and try to be clever, won't work won't work. It's immune to any changes in context because of dot bind. And that's also, it's also pretty cool. It's also pretty cool. So practical applications of this stuff. Practical applications of this in context. The problem, the real problem is that in a callback, this is always going to be window. Why? Why do they do that? So for example, set timeout. So here's an example of this. this is, if I did this with an anonymous function, it would look really weird. That's why that's why, because, of, because set timeout takes this other argument that makes it look really, really weird. Anyway, so, so name functions, I'm saying, okay, pizza.print set timeout, but set this after, it waits three seconds because it's, it's supposed to do milliseconds, right? And then it says, okay, well, after three seconds, it says undefined and undefined because pizza.print, oh, it's not, the context is not properly set. So some pseudocode for set timeout, basically what it does is it receives that function as, a, as this variable callback, so it's basically assigning it to a variable. And so it does other stuff, and then eventually it does this, callback, and calls it. That's why, because I'm calling it with no, with no object, with no owner, that's why this is window, and I get the problems again. Damn. So how do I fix that? How do I work around callbacks in context? A couple of different things you, you can take away here. Number one, bind, like we saw. If you, if you create a new function with bound, bind, and you bind it to that pizza, Nobody can change the context. So when you pass it to the, call, to the function that receives a callback, boom, it's bound, no problem, it's always gonna work. I can know for sure that this is gonna work. This, unfortunately though, is, is a bit slow. So if you have to do millions and millions of binds, ugh, your, your browser's gonna be like this. Okay, so, so uh, not a concern at first, okay? Wait for this to happen, but just so you know, it could be a problem if you get millions and millions of users, okay? Uh, how am I doing on time? Five minutes, okay, cool. Alrighty, three minutes, okay, well I'm about to wrap up. 
Uh, all right, so bind is one technique that you can do to prevent the callbacks from transforming your, 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 your method into like a non-method function. The other thing you can do is use a closure. If you make a closure, if you make a function called print pizza, it remembers that pizza is this thing, and then if you pass that under, then that will work. Okay? And so essentially you're doing basically the same thing as bind. You're making a function, a new function that's bound to pizza. Uh, but you can do it manually sometimes, you know, maybe because if this, arguably this is more readable, arguably it's more easier to understand, but it's more lines of code. So trade-offs. But this does the right thing. You'll get fancy arugula and, and mozzarella pizza. Okay. Whew. All right. That's that's it. That's that's all for the. In terms of the learning, we got through it. We did it. Good job. Good job. Okay. So I do have an exercise in store for you, but I'll I'll put that in the resources. Basically, in this link, you'll you'll find all my resources. They're not there yet. Right now, there's only a, a few links and the links to my slides. You'll have that. Uh, I'm going to be adding. Uh, in the rest of the day, I'm going to be adding a couple of exercises for you to put this into practice, and also some more in-depth resources that specific articles and blogs about all this different stuff that you can, you know, read on your own on your own pace. So bit.ly/exploring-js-functions, and that's going to link you to the uh, GitHub Markdown file, and all the links are going to be there. Okay. So, for example, you'll have things such as a link to Node School. Node School is a really good resource to uh, learn a bunch of different JavaScript uh, subjects, not just Node.js subjects, JavaScript subjects. Uh, those are interactive tutorials in your terminal. They'll give you an exercise, they'll give you some, some, some stuff to consume, some things to learn about, and then you'll have to kind of write the code that makes it, that makes it, the, makes it what they're asking for work. This is a really good thing, a really good resource. Uh, and so they, they cover things like functions, they cover things like the basis of JavaScript, they cover things like, uh, there's even one about Git. There's a lot of different ones. There's graphic, I think there's graphics programming. Uh, there's new, new ones coming out all the time. Okay. So Node School is a really good resource for learning uh, more JavaScript in depth. Also, as always, Mozilla Developer Network has a lot of in-depth articles about things like context and, and scope and all that stuff. Uh, some of these examples I took from MDN, I just renamed them to pizza theme themed examples and, and uh, made it work. So MDN, uh, they have like a specific JavaScript section with a bunch of really cool stuff. So definitely check that out. And a uh, uh, third major resource uh, I, I can recommend is uh, Effective JavaScript. It's a book that came out, I think, in 2014. Uh, really good book. It's written by a guy named Dave, Her Dave Herman. He works for Mozilla. He works on the JavaScript standard. And a uh, really good in-depth article about every nuance that you could possibly want in be interested in in JavaScript. And uh, spoiler alert. Uh, before WordPress, I have purchased 10 books, 10 copies of these, and we're going to be doing something with them. I don't know quite if we're going to raffle them or what, but 10 people are gonna, coming away with co a copy of this book. Okay. All right. And anyway, I've been, uh, I've been Nizar Khalifa Iglesias. Uh, you can follow me pretty much anywhere at my last name and my first name at, and Twitter on GitHub, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm there and everywhere. And so what I do is I work for Ironhack. You can see my, my shirt here. I'm, a, I'm the lead instructor there. We are a coding boot camp here in Miami and also in Madrid and Barcelona that we, we teach people web development. And so a lot of this stuff is stuff I had to teach beginners. You guys know JavaScript at least already. Imagine if you didn't know anything and you had to learn this. <sighs> okay. So these guys, every two months I have to, I have to do this. <laughs> but luckily they can ask me questions later. Anyway, so, so uh, uh, these are the students I'm teaching right now. They're a really awesome group, and uh, so they're actually going to work on their projects for the next two weeks. And uh, the reason I tell you this is because we're looking for mentors to help our students along their journey, to understand things like I tried to teach you today, and hopefully I was successful with at least some of you. And so uh, uh, if you're interested in, in, uh, in, in, in helping out, being a mentor is a four-hour commitment across two weeks. So obviously, you have to be local. And it's not I know that all of you are. Uh, but uh, if you're interested in doing that and you want to pay it forward, talk to me. And, uh, and apply to be a mentor. And hopefully a lot of you will want to do that. So uh, that's all I got. Thank you so much for your patience and for bearing with me in learning scope. And again, that link to, uh, for any further resources, I will be posting exercises on there for you guys to do. Okay, At least two exercises. All right, thank you.